collapsing into a black hole of novelty. And you don't know what an unrealized possibility would look like. So if you think about it like that, life gets a lot more interesting. This is a big thing. Like this is gonna touch all of us. Cream rules everything around you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the cream kingdom, bitch. Based. Like, I'm like super based. You're not even based, bro. Body. Body. How's it going, guys? We are back again, and... A lot has happened. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize. We've had a lot of family stuff going. As a, as a trucker, I, and by I, I mean we, have very little downtime that we're not driving. And with the holiday and all of that shit, I don't know. It just sounds like I'm making a bunch of excuses for why we haven't put out a video. But we've had one cooking for quite a while. So hopefully this one's good. Uh, for those who don't know what this channel is, we basically are just trying to present the information to all and sundry that we think AI is developing over the next three to five years, and it will turn to, you know, AGI, however you define that. Um, I typically define it by AI that can do all of the jobs that humans do, basically. That's... The point when essentially it becomes in the hands of the government of the United States to make sure it's safe to redistribute wealth to people who no longer have jobs because otherwise they won't be able to eat and the economy will crash. It'll pretty much redefine the entire economy. And specifically this channel I try to emphasize and hammer in the point that we don't have a reason to trust our government. Not only do I think it's been a capitalist system, so it's not going to just start communisting, um, nor do I think it's really healthy for a couple of individuals at a tech company and, you know, maybe a couple of individuals at the NSA. Uh, or the CIA having full control of basically godlike powerful technology. And I don't trust them. The reason why we don't trust them is based on their track record. And what we get into uh, in the first part of this podcast is some of the things that the CIA specifically has done that makes me very, very untrustworthy of them. And... I think the big thing that we're going to get into at the beginning of this here, because as many of you may know, uh, former President Donald Trump was shot at and had either a bullet or pieces of glass graze his ear at a rally with a very suspicious situation where a man with a gun climbed up in full view of the entire crowd pointed his gun at the president and the secret service didn't notice him there army crawling his way within full view and needless to say anybody with a brain is starting to wonder why this might be why such an obvious shooter would not have been recognized by the secret service whose only job is to prevent something like this happening and uh if indeed the Secret Service has colluded with some asset that wants Donald Trump dead, or perhaps just frightened, who would that be and what are their motivations? So we're going to start out with my first theory here, which is... So recently, the past couple weeks here, Donald Trump went on an a mostly AI kind of crypto podcast called the All In Podcast, it's a bunch of very cocky, kind of douchebaggy 
Gen Xers uh, chitter chattering about who the fuck knows what. And they asked him a bunch of questions about his financial decisions and blah, blah, blah. The only thing in the entire interview that actually interests me was when they said, so why in your last presidency did you not release the JFK files? And we're going to see what he had to say about that. So let's check this out. Sorry, I'm sorry. I have to ask 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 one question, sir. (laughs) When you got elected in in the 2016 election, you said the first thing or one of the things you wanted to do was release the JFK file. And then you said later, I saw it and I just, I wasn't really ready to do it. And then I saw a clip where you changed your mind and you said, I think we're ready to see this file. And I'm just curious. What's in it? What? I don't know. Tell us right now. now. What happened? Like what? (laughs) Yeah. I actually did do it. Uh, I released a lot, as you know. But when it came to the whole thing, I was hit by some people that worked for me that are great people that you would respect. And they asked me not to do it. And I'm saying, why? Tell me why. And they said, sir, I think it needs a little more time. And I released a lot. But I said, if they feel so strongly, I respect the people and would, would have done that again. But this time, I'm just going to do it. RFK says the CIA killed his his uh, uncle. Do you believe that? Well, this wasn't CIA that asked me, but I think CIA was probably behind it. But they didn't. They would have preferred that I not release the rest of it. So we we did give quite a bit. Uh, it's going to be done early on. A lot of people want to see that. And whatever it may say, I won't say. I sort of have an idea. But uh, whatever it is, it'll be very interesting for people to see. And we're going to have to learn from it. Promise us you'll come back again. Mr. You know, President. there are other things hour. we're going to release, too. We're going to release. Oh, really? Like what? what else do you got? <laughs> we'll talk to you about it off camera. Aliens? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I generally speaking, and there are reasons not to release certain things, obviously, but uh, I generally, you know, it's uh, transparency. And I, I think it's important that we release that. And there are other things, too. There are other things that uh, you know about. But people, more than anything else, they want the JFK files. We're going to release that immediately. Oof. <laughs> yeah, oof is right. <laughs> Literally a couple weeks ago, and now he has an attempt on his life. The first attempt on a president's life since, what, Reagan? Since Ronald Reagan? Yeah. That's a long time to go without a president getting shot at. And it happens two weeks after the president says, you know what? I think the CIA was behind it, and I'm going to release the JFK files to let you all know why it was hidden, why it was covered up during the Warren Commission when uh, they put Alan Dulles on the Warren Commission that investigated JFK's death, who happened to have been the head of the CIA that JFK had literally just fired. And then two weeks after that happened is when JFK died. Mm. After he fired the head of the CIA. So we're starting to pick up a little bit of a... Pattern? Yeah, a little bit of a pattern, wouldn't you say? Doesn't that make sense? (laughs) Yeah. So uh, we got another video here. And uh, let's let's check out what... uh, Man, I forgot. It's not Matt Taibbi. It's it's an investigative journalist. I'll put it in the bottom so you can see what his name is. That. So they're just totally correct. Do you ever hear any left liberals ever anymore talking about the evils of the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, the U.S. security state? Never, never, ever. Maybe Homeland Security for being too like aggressive with immigrants. But other than that, like the that discourse is gone. If you talk about the CIA and the FBI now, people that gets coded as like Trump, Trumpism and like warning about deep state the deep state and like they mock the idea that there's a deep state that's like been fundamental to left-wing politics for as long as i can remember and now it, it reads as like you know trumpian right-wing paranoia. but it's just it's an, you know any country run by its intel and law enforcement agencies is an authoritarian country it's not a democratic country they're they're they were built to be outside of the democratic system there's no they're built to be a secret agency within the government that is immune to democratic accountability and the amazing thing is when they had those hearings like after the twitter files and all of that every single democrat 
stood up and said, like when Matt Taibbi went to testify, they were lecturing him saying like, have you ever considered the fact that the people at the CIA and the FBI and our security state agencies are doing this to protect us, not to harm us? <laughs> Can you imagine, like, and like, even the 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 le like AOC, same thing. Like, even the left wing sectors of the Democratic Party, there's no space to criticize. Are there any? Are there any left liberals holding office? Have we started, by the way? Yeah, yeah. The left doesn't really uh, critique the CIA, especially not the neo libs, as they're called. The uh, the people in the Democratic Party, the DNC. And all of the people that shill for them are pretty much like, like, I don't know why this is. And, and I wouldn't say that I'm conservative by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, look at me. But I definitely don't trust the Democrats at all. Do I trust the Republicans? Fuck no. No, I don't trust anybody. I don't think anybody with a thinking brain would be able to because both sides if you look at the history of the bills they've passed they've all passed things that are good for defense contractors are good for pharmaceutical companies are good for big agriculture and absolutely shilled to the banks we can't trust people that have hundreds of millions of dollars despite having a salary that's like only a couple hundred thousand that that's not a system that we should trust there makes zero sense why we should trust corrupt politicians and let's call it what it is they are corrupt so when democrats large largely start stigmatizing and making everything that's slightly conspiracy theory sounding into you know you know well you're a trumper you know you're clearly mentally ill you know you're you're losing your touch of reality all of the fucking things that people say whenever you bring up anything slightly conspiracy minded you don't start to wonder that that's maybe politically beneficial to them So speaking of the CIA and the things that they've fucking done, this is a little clip uh, that goes straight into some history. And this was recently covered and absolutely made my fucking day when I found this out. This was covered on one of my favorite conspiracy channels on YouTube called The Y Files. Um, check it out if you don't know what it is. It's absolute YouTube gold. And this is a history of when the CIA sold fucking heroin. Who established the China Medical Board in 1910, aiding the Green Gang with legitimate shipments of opium to American heroin labs. Since Paul Heliwell was working to aid Chang and the KMT, and since opium was at the center of their financial structure, he presented an idea to Wild Bill Donovan, Alan Dulles, and James Jesus Angleton. Here was the idea. What if the OSS helped facilitate the KMT's opium trade in the East to ensure continued cash flow for the anti-communist forces? If the flow of heroin continued unimpeded, this would clearly help the Chinese nationalists win the war. This marked the beginning of the CIA's long storied history in international narcotics smuggling. Unsurprisingly, Wild Bill and the OSS elite cadre were thrilled with Heliwell's plan and immediately began funneling funds to his office in China to support Chang's lucrative opium trade. Eventually, this funding would actually come directly from Nazi fortunes that had been secured and looted by Dulles and Donovan, as we discussed in previous parts. Heliwell's efforts during the war culminated in the creation of the Civil Air Transport, a local commercial airline run by the nationalist Chinese government and later the CIA, that was used to ship heroin across Southeast Asia. Civil Air Transport was created with the help of Claire Cheneau, a former U.S. Army Air Force captain who had formed a private mercenary air force for Chiang Kai-shek using covert American war funds. Cheneau had lobbied FDR to provide funds to create a private air force for the Generalissimo. Eventually, this air force became a reality, known as the Flying Tigers. 
So uh, I don't know if that clip really got into the whole details of exactly what the CIA were funding. I'll tell you, they were funding Nazi and fascist terrorist groups in France, Spain, no, France, Germany, and Italy, uh, specifically to fight the rise of communism, which, you know, okay, sure, they were in a Cold War. Sure, maybe they wanted to fight communism by funding terrorists that bombed and killed innocent civilians. Well, maybe they had a reason to be uh, hiding where these funds came from and selling heroin to fund that. And uh, the next person I hear tell me, well, you know, that was a long time ago. Shut the fuck up. It wasn't a long time ago. Our grandfathers were literally in high school when this shit was going on. Stop. Stop it. It went as so. The OSS and later the CIA would facilitate the global heroin trade through a network of organized crime elements and warlords to fund their illegal activities post-war, using the growing New York jazz scene as a testing ground. This was the miracle that Wild Bill and the OSS officers needed in the wake of Truman's hardline approach to their poor performance during the war. The agents in the OSS immediately got to work implementing Operation X. Just as a warning, it's about to get really complicated here, folks, so hang with me. Let's begin. Frank Wisner, the head of covert operations in the future CIA, alongside James Jesus Angleton, the head of counterintelligence, developed a working relationship with Meyer Lansky, often considered the most prolific and wealthy mafia boss in US history. Lansky had successfully united the Jewish, Italian, and Irish mobs into a massive nationwide structure termed the National Crime Syndicate. Lansky was deeply connected to organized crime across the country, becoming a millionaire as a bootlegger during the Prohibition in the 30s, and introducing the mob to legal gambling enterprises in Cuba, where he owned several casinos. Let's quickly put a pin in the Cuban mob connection for now. This will become a very important point when talking about the Kennedy assassination, so remember this for later. Lansky was considered the mob's accountant and the mastermind behind the sprawling criminal social it only gets better, doesn't it? Mm, no. Yeah, they were literally in bed with the fucking mafia. The other guy that helped them was a mafia boss called Lucky Luciano. And he controlled the ports, and that's how they were able to get tons and tons of heroin into New York. Does that sound like an organization that you should just immediately trust with godlike technology? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go with no. No, it doesn't. And uh, one of my favorite people of all time, um, the gay, transphobic, radio presenter, douchebag, asshole, Tim Dillon, who is incredibly funny. And uh, considering the things that I've been able to clip him saying, you might want to actually think he uh, knows what's up. So check this out. Lone pedophiles anymore. I don't even believe that. If you're a pedophile, you're like in a group. You know what I mean? Uh, you know? Well, I'm not even uh, I'm not even going there, but staying on just Lane. Uh, so you believe there's some power in her. What do you think happens to her now? Like what what are the great, different great question? I mean, I don't know what'll happen to her, but I imagine she'll get some type of deal, uh, closed door thing years from now when people don't really care about the case and she'll serve some time in a in a very lax thing or she'll be killed. I mean, again, it's like if she was doing what she was doing, which is, I believe, a fact that she was compromising powerful people so that they could be blackmailed by uh you know the intelligence uh services of the u.s and israel um uh, probably i don't i don't see how she wasn't doing that someone's black someone's using the photos and the tapes right someone's using that against these people someone wants to control these people well who and why that's the real question and i think the real question is you want to con you want to exert control over congressmen and senators and presidents because 
They have the power to make decisions to affect the but the CIA just works for a lot of very wealthy people. That's what the CIA was. That's how the CIA started, right? It was lawyers, bankers. They're protecting financial interests of multinational corporations all over the world, overthrowing democratically elected governments, going in and doing subterfuge campaigns, encouraging terror. They were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I don't see why that would change. I think that's who they still represent, and I think those people want uh, certain policies and certain people pushed forward, and I think those people are controlled, and I think one of the ways to control people is their sexual problems, uh, and, and that's the way they did it. Am I right, folks? Is that not one of the best paragraphs you've ever heard put into speech? Yeah. Pretty much. It's fucking incredible how well he summed everything up. The only other two things I would add, just factually, to what he's saying about Ghislaine Maxwell, is who he's originally talking about when he said she was helping him. He's talking about Jeffrey Epstein. Ghislaine Maxwell, her father was Robert Maxwell, one of the most famous British Mossad aligned billionaires of all time. He was murdered by Mossad on a yacht after he basically like embezzled Mossad, <laughs> which if you're going to embezzle somebody. Probably don't embezzle one of the the least morally aligned intelligence agencies of all time. Not a great idea. So, yeah. So when people are like, oh, Ghislaine Maxwell wasn't part of Mossad. That's Zionist. I mean, that's, uh, excuse me, that's anti-Semitist. No, no, she absolutely was part of Mossad. There's no question about it. And when her father was killed with all of that money gone, I don't know if you've ever watched a mafia movie about what happens to the kids of parents that lose the mafia's money. Execution. No, the kids are made to work for their parents' debt. That's just how it works. Of course she was working for Mossad. Are you kidding? Obviously she was. And then the last part he was talking about was how the CIA is directly controlled to multinational corporations and banks. Uh, it doesn't sound very democratic to me. Um, and you want know the proof of that? It was literally founded when it was the OSS, when all that heroin trafficking was going on. It was founded by Alan and Foster Dulles during World War II. And who were Alan and Foster Dulles, you might ask? They were one of the two of the most powerful lawyers in Wall Street. I mean, that's right there at the start. Like, it doesn't it doesn't change. Like, once you have a chain of command and like a an active, thriving mafia. The mafia doesn't just go, oh, well, now we're just putting in, you know, pools and doing landscaping now. We're not doing casinos anymore. We're not ripping people off anymore. We're not killing people anymore. We definitely are good now. We're, we're definitely good. Oh, look. We got kiddie pools half off. We're selling them. Come by. 1-800-MAFIA-POOLS. Yeah, no. No, the mafia is still the mafia. They don't just become something that's not rapacious and evil. So when people say, oh, the CIA is different now. It's, it's there to protect us. It's like, no, the fuck what? it's not. It's never been there to protect us. It's because during World War II, American businesses wanted to know that their their business profits were not going to be completely fucked if the U.S. lost the war. That's why the CIA is, exists. It's so obvious. I don't understand why that's not common knowledge. Please tell people this. Please try and learn how to elucidate this in a way that people can understand because the amount of people that are like, oh, you conspiracy theorists, you're all like the QAnon Trump tards, no. First of all, <laughs> I've got a clip for you about QAnon. A lot of very intelligent people, and I would consider Whitney Webb, 
to be one of the most intelligent people in this arena, have very good reason to believe that QAnon was a CIA psyop. Check this out. And here he goes being like, nothing was done wrong in the Epstein sweetheart deal. What do you, who and, do you think you know. QAnon is? If you had to speculate as to the, who is QAnon or what is QAnon, I mean, we know it's some kind of troll operation at this point, you know? I mean, what do you think it is? Do you think there was any truth to it at any point or was it always kind of trolling? I mean, it seems to be a bit, you know, it's, it's clearly over the top and ridiculous. They also, you know, it's kind of like, you know, they keep stringing these desperate people along that there's going to be some yeah. big event coming and nothing can stop what's happening and everyone's going to jail and just you wait and see and trust the plan and everything like that. What do you, what do you, what do you think this is? I think it's a, I think it's a U.S. driven intelligence psyop. Um, and I yeah. think basically the target of it is to have, uh, you know, uh, the, a demographic that would normally be most vocal against uh, perceived government tyranny, uh, people on the right, gun owners, things like that, um, basically to have them completely docile sitting there being like, yeah, we'll just trust the plan and it'll all work out. And even in some cases, you've had QAnon cheer on regime change in Iran, war with Iran, uh, martial law being declared. Um, right. things like that when these people before would have opposed those things. And it's worth pointing out that really the roadmap for QAnon was uh, was originally developed by a, um, an Obama advisor named Cass Sunstein, who now is advising the, the World Health Organization about its vaccine, global vaccine agenda uh, for COVID-19. But Cass Sunstein, uh, during the Obama administration, he wrote about the need to for the government to infiltrate conspiracy movements in order to reverse the uh, general trend of conspiracy movements fostering a distrust in the government and to instead foster a love and trust of government. So then you have QAnon pop up and it's, oh, we love Trump, we love the president, we love John Bolton, we love Sessions and all of these people who were obvious establishment swamp monsters to use, you know, Trump vernacular or whatever. Um, you know, put all your faith in people like that. When John Bolton is like the most insane, that you know, like crazy neocon guy, yeah. and you're going to put his, your trust in him that he's going to end the wars, you know? Yeah, I, I just, mean, it's so amazing control. to watch these guys, even after, you know, to this we have this election and... You know, they're still up there going, trust the plan, don't worry about it. I mean, it seems just like a grift. I mean, it's clearly a grift. Yeah, but so here's the thing with QAnon, too. QAnon was basically designed to be a giant straw man where everything that is uh, bad, now they're saying all these conspiracies that are inconvenient right now are merging with QAnon, and that right. inclu includes people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Right. and Children's Health Defense which are critics of, of the pharmaceutical industry and the vaccine industry in general, you know, there's the Washington Post coming out saying that they're merging with QAnon with no actual basis. Right. But they write a whole article about how uh, people that, um, you know, promote vaccine hesitancy like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. are national security threats. And you had Q, uh, the FBI come out last year saying QAnon is a domestic terror threat and all of this stuff. And now they're trying to link people that are critical of the pharmaceutical industry right. to so Q, QAnon. Q, QAnon's That's a really great, alarming. They're a, treating enemies of corporations yeah. like enemies of the state. QAnon's a great whipping boy for a lot of people that just want to get inconvenient questions about certain government policies and certain people. Or Epstein. Or Epstein or any of that stuff. What do you think uh, is going to happen with the new coronavirus lock? Is that making any sense? Are you following the logic here? Yes. I don't think people pay enough attention to what convenient narratives are and why they're being spread. And oftentimes the reverse psychology of what if there was like a really stupid, loud, brash, infectious conspiracy channel that got super, super popular. Everybody's talking about it. And then was therefore super, super easy to make all of those people look like total fucking idiots. It's a little convenient. It's like you took out the ability to be a conspiracy theorist in an upstanding social setting like that. Mm. Maybe you should pay attention. 
as to who might be benefited by that happening. So uh, speaking of multinational corporations having a lot of interest in, uh, you know, getting rid of conspiracy theories, uh, what about tech companies? That's a multinational corporation, isn't it? Yes, true. Check this shit out. Sam Altman and Google and Microsoft going in front of Congress a few months ago and basically saying, yes, please regulate us. Let us create this regulatory moat so that we are the gatekeepers of artificial intelligence. Yeah, anytime the the private, super powerful corporate world goes like, regulate me harder, daddy, in front of Congress, you know, there is fuckery afoot for sure. Um, I mean, basically what you have to keep in mind here, and a lot of people forget this too, Silicon Valley, pretty much all of those main companies uh, were made by like intelligence services or the military or with funding from one or two, or if they weren't initially are now contractors and all intertwined with the national security state. So, okay. Um, I mean, that's why we have these things like people now getting upset about Facebook censoring stuff, but Facebook, you know, was essentially tied up with DARPA and, you know, the CIA through Peter Thiel, uh, from, from the very beginning. Right. So is it really that surprising that they would censor on behalf of the state? No, they're an independent private company. No, that's like a total, uh, that's a lie. Like the whole thing about Silicon Valley being all these like humble entrepreneurs tinkering around in their garage and look at what we've made with the American and entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, that's such bullshit. Like if you look into any of these big companies, uh, you always had, you know, these powerful entities of the state there. And so there are extensions of state power, even if you want to think that they weren't necessarily at the origins, you can't deny that now. I mean, they fused essentially. That's why you have people like Eric Schmidt, which is why reading this book is really important. This is the most influential guy on AI policy in the US right now. He's funding salaries of like all of the Biden administration's top AI people. It's totally illegal for him to do that, but he's doing it. And even like mainstream media, like Politico's reporting on it and nothing's happened. It's crazy. It's just, he's in charge. And he ran the National Security Commission on AI, uh, which basically laid out all of the policies. And that commission was this, the CIA uh, and people tied up with the CIA, like former heads of NQTEL that are very close friends of Schmidt, uh, military people that are also tied up with Schmidt because he used to be head of the, not the head, but used to be involved with the Defense Innovation Board. And uh, and then, you know, the big Silicon Valley companies, Amazon, Microsoft, um, all of those guys deciding what happens. I mean, they're really the same entity at this point because they're all either military intelligence contractors um, and you can't really decide where one ends and the other one ends. And you have all of these Silicon Valley billionaires, you know, they fund Congress essentially at this point or the DNC or the RNC. So, yeah. um, no. you know, the national security state Silicon Valley blob is what runs <clears throat> the U S. Hmm. Eric Schmidt. Um, so yeah, really nice guy, Eric Schmidt. He has a lot of philanthropic projects about climate change and shit. He talks the liberal talk. He's like right up there. He's like Bill Gates Jr. Um, yeah, in a lot of ways, it's bizarre to me when people are like, oh, well, you know, I think the government's working to try and make these AI things good for everybody. And I think we need to just trust the process. It's like, bro, you're sounding like QAnon. You're sounding like the liberal version of QAnon. Shut the fuck up. Do you know anything about Eric Schmidt? No. Do you know anything about uh, the guy that Eric Schmidt wrote a book about AI with? Henry Kissinger? Henry Kissinger is one of the most famous and bloody war criminals of all time. Cambodia, the country, can't take a regular shit anymore. It just falls out of their ass. That's how much he fucked up that country. The amount of coups and genocides Henry Kissinger had his fingers in is unbelievable. Just look him up. Just look him up. That's who Eric Schmidt wrote a book about AI with. <laughs> yeah, uh, a little more on Eric Schmidt here. So I 
So I decided to write about something I've wanted to do for a while, though it's kind of torturous, which is uh, to read uh, the book on AI written by Henry Kissinger and former (laughs) Google CEO Eric Schmidt. And, you know, I wasn't really surprised for what I found. It's fucking nuts. Um, And so my piece for them is titled The Final Coup. Uh, because I think that's really what it is. So, you know, Henry Kissinger, what has his whole career been, really? So he ran the State Department, and he was, like, you know, an operator for groups like the Trilateral Commission and a lot of these other entities that want, like, global technocracy as sort of designed by groups like the Rockefellers, you know, for... Uh, for quite a long time and uh, at the State Department, you know, sort of turned uh, using the State Department into an uh, an engine for coup d'etats, you know, into an art form. And then, of course, he leaves the State Department, but essentially trains up most of the other subsequent secretaries of state, including people uh, like Hillary Clinton, for example, um, among others, of course, who would then go on and uh, do regime change. So, you know, he's a coup guy. You know, uh, and definitely very into real politique and all of these things and a a war criminal and obviously doesn't um, care about the little people. I think one of his more infamous quotes is about, you know, calling U.S. soldiers like dumb beasts that are like pawns for the people that actually, uh, you know, decide what happens in the world. So uh, definitely an elitist worldview. And you also find that in this book. Yeah, pretty much everything I just said right before I played this clip. Yeah, when she talks about the Trilateral Commission, the Trilateral Commission is one of the most secretive and powerful groups of European and United States bankers and elites that essentially lobby together to decide, like, if if anybody's talking about, oh, the Illuminati, they have these secret societies, it's the Trilateral Commission. They're doing it in the open. It's not like in gowns with like candles and shit. No, they're literally sitting in a giant meeting room in their little fucking suits. And they're saying, oh, this is what our agenda is. This is what we need to do to move government to get that way. And all of these government fucks completely suck their dick. And uh, another one very similar another group very similar to the trilateral commission is a uh, le cirque which uh i got a little clip on here for you member of parliament alan clark's diary which he published in the late 1990s le cirque is an atlanticist society of right-wing dignitaries and a right-wing think tank funded by the cia which churns out cold war concept this CIA funding source is not surprising, as the article continues to name members of the Cirque, such as former directors of the CIA William Casey and William Colby, Henry Kissinger, and former President Nixon after his time in office. And of course, according to Van Vuren, David Rockefeller, and finally, Brian Crozier, who has a lengthy resume of deep political activities in the UK, most notably as the head of the Information Research Department in the UK, Foreign Service, which was led. So have you ever like, no, the CIA isn't in bed with all of these bankers and multinational elite companies and no, they're definitely not doing political plotting together. Oh, they are. They absolutely are. And they have been for a long time. Check out this next clip talking about the empowered class or the ownership class. But then you read on and they start essentially talking about this two tier society model. So basically they're like, well, this AI quote unquote revolution will be very empowering for some people. You know, the policymakers, uh, the heads of multinational corporations, the people who design AI and, and code it and task it and regulate it, they'll find this very empowering. But then the people who, you know, consume AI from, you know, the consumer level um, or are just sort of, you know, not part of that other tier, everyone else really, uh, will be bewildered by its opaque decision making and, uh, you know, 
will be disempowered or find it disconcerting and won't really have any control over their lives anymore. And then over time will cease to be able to realize what's happening to them. And uh, I mean, that's that's literally what the book is about. It's oh. very nuts and talks about, you know, AI is basically going to draw people, mainly this disempowered class into a new version of reality that, that is essentially being designed by the empowered class, right? The technocrats, I guess you could call them. Yeah, if you ever think, oh, let's trust the government. Uh, no, yeah, never. let's Let's look and see what Eric Schmidt is actually up to behind the scenes. He's starting a new company, guys. Check this shit out. <laughs> Eric Schmidt's AI combat drones. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, is quietly developing AI-powered combat drones through his secret adventure, initially known as White Stork and now rumored to be Project Eagle. Yeah, basically he's just making killer drones. He's designing what people for the longest time have said is one of the most dangerous weapons that any civilization could ever have access to. And we're not talking like drones like they're using in Ukraine. Although he literally went to Ukraine to see how drone warfare was being carried out. Him, Schmidt, went to fucking Ukraine. He wants to make suicide or kamikaze drones, which is a little bit different than just drop a grenade as it flies over. Schmitty is creepy. He is almost wanting to commit, su not suicide, but genocide. Yeah, the latter, for sure. Um, White stork. Speaking of genocide, uh, uh, there's a short film that came out a little while ago that I saw when it came out in, uh, I don't know, 2018 or something like that. Seriously, watch this shit. Send it to your friends. This is what we have to look forward to. This is not a, te a fanciful sci-fi technology. This is a technology that exists and is being made economically more effective and efficient due to manufacturing at scale. This is what we have to look forward to. It's flying itself. Its processor can react 100 times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. They used to say guns don't kill people. People do. Well, people don't. They get emotional, disobey orders, aim high. Let's watch the weapons make the decisions. Now, trust me, these were all bad guys. Now that is an airstrike of surgical precision. It's one of a range of products. Trained as a team, they can penetrate buildings, cars, trains, evade people, bullets, pretty much any countermeasure. They cannot be stopped. Now, I said this was big. Why? Because we are thinking big. Watch. $25 million order now buys this. Enough to kill half a city, the bad half. Nuclear is obsolete. Take out your entire enemy, virtually risk-free. Just characterize him, release the swarm, and rest easy. These are available today. Ooh, no. 
Does that make you, like, have a pit in your stomach? Just seeing that? Seeing what that fucking smug technocrat looks like? Probably a more attractive version of Eric Schmidt. This is exactly what he's trying to do. And the thing he said, pay attention, the thing he said at the end, it makes nuclear weapons no longer necessary. If you have technology like this, there's this thing called deterrence that's no longer a thing. Deterrence is the thing that keeps us, China and Russia, from shooting nuclear weapons at each other because it means everyone's going to die. And we don't want that. However, if we have technology that allows us to remove deterrence, uh, we might be a little more trigger happy, don't you think? So yeah, <laughs> thinking about the CIA in a whole new light and trying to understand what this new world that we're living in is and like what it means that's real that's why i'm trying to go back and like look at the history and see what the cia has done and be like why should we trust them so after world war ii when it was the oss before it was made the cia harry s truman hesitated he really wasn't he didn't think that it was a good idea during peacetime to have a branch of government and military that has no oversight because it has to be secret and you can't have civilian oversight and it be secret at the same time so he knew essentially he was creating something that had a very bad omen for the future and then later he kind of apologized for having created the CIA look at this I never would have agreed to the formation, formulation of the Central Intelligence Agency back in 47 if I had known it would become the American Gestapo. Does that make sense? What's Gestapo? Gestapo is... <laughs> Sounds like gazpacho soup. It does. It does sound like gazpacho soup. Um, the Gestapo is the Soviet... Um, I'm retarded. No, the uh, my brain is not working. I'm, I I like history. I'm not a history buff by any sense of the word. But yeah, the Gestapo is either Soviet or German, uh, like secret police. Oh, I think German maybe. I don't know. So that's just another word for police. I, yeah. Well, yeah. No, but the secret police were a little bit worse than police. Ew. They were doing surveillance they were torturing people they were assassinating people they were literally evil as fuck and they were working for the government under fascism Ugh. or communism whichever okay. one Gross. so yeah that's what the cia has become and there's a lot of movies about the gestapo look them up they're okay. chilling uh so check this out this is the whole reason why I'm trying to make this point. As soon as we don't have jobs and we don't provide economic utility to the powers that be, suddenly we have no rights. Because the only reason they keep us around is because we offer economic utility and that's what gives us our rights. That's what gives us a part in this country and makes us useful to the powerful people we make them money we fund their lifestyle we give them power as soon as we don't anymore what rights do we have seriously none helen keller said rights are the things we get when we are strong enough to make good our claim on them just take a second and think throughout history think about Genghis Khan. How many people do you think Genghis Khan respected the rights of? None. If he could conquer them, what did he do to those people? He literally genocided them, 
but only after having first raped and tortured them. He piled those people so high you couldn't take a wagon down a road because of the amount of bodies for miles. That is just a known little thing about Genghis Khan that historians recorded at the time. Yeah, anytime you have a people group that doesn't have a way to enforce their own rights, they aren't there anymore. You catch my dress? You kind of yes. see where I'm going with this? Yep, yep. So, uh, <laughs> this is an AI researcher. I, I feel a little bit bad bringing up this clip because I don't really think he's that bad of a person, but he just said something that kind of, <laughs> it kind of tipped me off. So watch this real quick. Differences in intelligence between humans. Uh, maybe the intelligence test, because of uh, reasons you mentioned, are not measuring it well, but clearly there's differences in intelligence between different humans. Sure. What is your explanation for what's going on there? Because I think that's sort of compatible with this, my story, that there's a spectrum of generality and that these models are climbing up to a human level. And even some humans haven't even climbed up to the Einstein level or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Francois level. But <laughs> so That's a great question. You know, um, there is extensive evidence that intelligence... Uh, difference in intelligence are mostly genetic in nature, right? Meaning that if you take someone who is not very intelligent, there is no amount of training, of like training data you can expose that person to that would uh, uh, make them become Einstein. And this kind of points to the fact that you really need uh, a better architecture, you need a better algorithm, and more training data is not in fact all you need. So essentially what he's saying is that science solidly supports that if somebody has bad genetics and isn't intelligent, you can't necessarily just educate them better and make them intelligent. I mean, I don't know who's doing that science. I have yet to look into that science, but it doesn't sound like a very human-friendly conclusion. No. Especially when you have elites that are thinking about transhumanism, that are thinking about making themselves better with technology to where they themselves, not the AI they control, but they themselves are as powerful as gods. Like any, any Marvel movie you can think of, AI that's able to do all of the science is potentially capable of creating humans to be able to reach a similar level. We will have powers of intellect and physical ability unlike anything we can dream of right now. If we get to that point. Well, we won't. The elites will and then extinguish us. Yeah, for sure. Because eugenicists, it was a very common thing before World War II for rich people to be pro-eugenicist. And a lot of them, including Bill Gates' dad, which yeah. I believe I've mentioned previously, was openly eugenicist until World War II happened when suddenly genetic purging and that kind of stuff kind of fell out of approval. And then they kind of started being more low key about it, right? So when elites are in power, you got to wonder what are they going to do with the stupid people? What are they going to do with the average people that don't add anything in particular from their perspective to humanity? Destroy, numb them and destroy them. Simple as that. It's a pretty simple conclusion, yeah. So uh, we're going to get into this next clip. I am still going to be playing clips from Leopold Aschenbrenner, the incredible former OpenAI employee that was fired for allegedly leaking, although he, the way he told the story didn't really sound like he did much leaking. It was kind of a misunderstanding. Uh, it sounded like mostly they fired him because he was telling the board members of OpenAI that... It's highly likely that any frontier technology in the AI sphere, as soon as it reaches a certain power level, will be nationalized by the military and the CIA and the NSA. And 
Uh, other people in opening I didn't really want him talking to the board about that. Since that interview has come out, since his paper that he released called Situational Awareness, which if you have time to read a 160 page scientific paper, please do yourself a favor. If you're doubting any of the stuff that I'm saying, like, oh, it's not going to it's not going to develop that fast. You know, it's not that big of a deal. It's not going to become a military. Thing. Just read the paper. Please do. Actually read the paper. You won't regret it. So I'm going to play some clips from this. Since this interview, the director of the NSA for 20 years during the period of time that Edward Snowden did the whistleblowing about the horrifying abuses of human rights that were going on with rights to privacy. That guy, Rob Nakasome, is now on the board of OpenAI since this interview came out. Check this out. This guy knew what the fuck was he was talking about. He really is incredible and should be listened to so much more than I think people really give him credit for. Yeah, I mean, look, look on the on the project, you know, I mean, there's sort of descriptive and, and prescriptive claims or sort of normative positive claims. I think the main thing I'm trying to say is, you know, you know, look, we're at, we're at these SF parties or whatever, and I think people talk about AGI, and they're always just talking about the private AI labs. And I think I just really want to challenge that assumption. It just seems like, it seems pretty likely to me, you know, as we've talked about, for reasons we've talked about, that, look, like the national security state is going to get involved. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of ways this could look like, right? Is it is it like nationalization? Is it a public-private partnership? Is it a kind of defense contractor-like relationship? Is it a sort of government project that soaks up all the people? Um, and so there's a spectrum there. Um, but I think people are just vastly underrating um, the chances of this more or less looking like a government project. Um, and look, I mean, look, if, if, you know, it's sort of like, you know, do you, do you think, do you think like we all have literal, like, you know, when we have like literal super intelligence on our cluster, right? And it's like, you know, you have a hundred billion, they're like, sorry, you have a billion like super intelligent scientists, they can like hack everything, they can like Stuxnet the Chinese data centers, you know, they're starting to build the robo armies, you know, you like, you really think that'll be like a private company and the government would be like, oh my God, what is going on? You know, like, yeah. You have to be very stupid to think that. And they haven't until now until hiring the NSA director had any words about future nationalization, about the, the warfare use. In fact, for the longest time, OpenAI had in their their mission statement as a company that they would not let any part of OpenAI, of the AI that they make, be used for military purposes. And then uh, quietly, secretly, earlier this year, they said, oh, no, we're actually going to let that be a thing oh yep yeah, military purposes is a-okay <laughs> mm. things are changing it reminds me of when google uh changed their mission from something like to do good and took the do good part out of their mission <laughs> statement it's like oh i mean geez but at least you're honest about it <laughs> Yeah, so speaking about the NSA, uh, even good old bro Jogan talking about this shit. Well, also, um, they just announced that the former chief of NSA is going to the board of OpenAI, which has oh, wow. freaked a bunch of people out, wow. including Edward Snowden. Oh, Does yeah. that freak you out, Jamie? Yeah, it's a big smile on Jamie's face. Well, I would imagine they would want to get involved in something like that. I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't. I yeah. mean... It, yeah, I could see, I could put on my conspiracy tinfoil hat thing and say, oh my God, what are they trying to do this? But Ed Edward Snowden eviscerates OpenAI's decision to put former NSA director on its board. This is a willful, calculated betrayal of the rights of every person on Earth. Hmm. hmm. Obviously, he has a beef with the NSA. Obviously, he has a beef with the NSA. Yeah, no shit. Who the fuck doesn't? I guess not Joe. <laughs> I don't. I actually don't think Joe Knows fully anything. trusts the NSA at all. He talks about that all the time, like the whistleblowing act that Edward Snowden did. But yeah, this is OpenAI's statement uh, announcing on June 13th, last month, that Paul M. Nakasone is now joining their board of directors. And then 
<laughs> the community notes on X. Paul M. Nakazone is a former director of NSA. Under his watch, the NSA expanded programs to legally, illegally surveil the U.S.'s own citizens. The Twitter files revealed a practice of a revolving door practice of big tech hiring former agency members to expand surveillance. Oh, mm. love that. No. Love that when they're censoring social media narratives. That's not an abuse of power. That's not something that would cause us to be mistrustful of the new board member of OpenAI. Yeah. So let's see what uh, Edward Snowden posted about that that uh, was being quoted. <laughs> he said, they've gone full mask off. Do not ever trust OpenAI or its products, ChatGPT, etc. There is only one reason for appointing an NSA governing director to your board. This is a willful calculated betrayal of the rights of every person on earth you have been warned so uh we got this little thing here this is a podcast called svik which they're kind of douchebags i don't listen to them very often but when the paul nakasome nsa director thing came out i was like oh i'll hear what they have to say and they gave a little bit of more information about the other intelligence related connections that exist within OpenAI. So check this out. Who's on OpenAI's board. But then if you look at OpenAI internally, their VP of security has 21 years working at the FBI. And then their director of security under him has another 20 years working in the FBI. So there are people all through the organization that are connected to the, to the US government, which also is another, another nail in the coffin regarding. Nail in the coffin indeed. Um, so let's check out this clip. This is Rob Nakasome himself in one of the cringiest and most obviously poorly rehearsed and very scripted <laughs> interviews I've ever heard. Like it's not, it doesn't even qualify as an interview. It makes Jimmy Fallon seem like completely candid. Uh, check this shit out. AI. I mean, we can't have a conversation today without talking about AI. What is NSA doing with AI? Artificial intelligence, machine learning. I mean, think about what is really going to be able to change the, the future of our nation, the future of our economy. We think about AI. And so we have been working artificial intelligence for a number of different years. Where we're focused on is focused on the security, security of the data, security of the infrastructure, security of the supply chain. We just set up the Artificial Intelligence Security Center, and it's co-located with the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center. So outside of the National Security Agency, being able to work with a number of partners, this is to ensure a secure ecosystem and predominantly really to ensure that as we look at this new technology, it gives our nation all the opportunities we need while ensuring that we're able to mitigate some of the challenges. Yeah, uh, when he's talking about how much it's gonna impact the economy and how much it's going to impact our global policy. He's not the person that you should go, oh, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, he literally does. He's defined our global approach to information and national security for 20 years. Maybe you should pay attention when he's talking about how important AI is going to be. I don't know. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. And uh, given the fact that he was literally there during all of those human rights privacy abuses, maybe you should think maybe he's not exactly someone we should trust either, despite all of his expertise. I don't trust him. He looks like the dad from Iron Giant. <laughs> Hell yeah. Or one of the lieutenants, so no. <laughs> uh, so this is a little part of him talking about China. Let's talk strategic competition. Our listeners may not understand what that means. Can you talk about that a little bit? Think of the world today. When we, uh, when we consider what is the, the challenge to America for today, tomorrow, well into the future, I think it begins with really two different, uh, two different entities. First of all, it's the strategic challenge of China. This is our pacing challenge for the nation. Diplomatically, informationally, military, economically, this is a country that really is attempting to uh, supplant the world order. And secondly, is the acute 
uh, threat of Russia. This is uh, a nation that has illegally invaded Ukraine. This is a nation that continues to, to utilize a series of different cyber actors to conduct malicious operations. This is an acute threat to the United States. Yeah, there's such an acute threat to the United States that uh, instead of actually realizing that maybe this godlike technology that we are racing them to develop, maybe we should slow down. Maybe we should make a, some kind of like agreement with them that we can share clusters, we can share research, and we can slow it down and find a way to do it more safely. Maybe we should do that instead of just like rushing ahead and trying to beat them to it in a warlike manner. Maybe right. that's not a great idea. Um, and uh, even Trump has something to say about China. Hmm. China. What's he have to say? To a country. And I actually think that the way Afghanistan worked, uh, I think that when Putin looked at that, he said, wow, let's go in. And you know who else looked at it? President Xi of China. And he's looking, he is looking at Taiwan and he's drooling. He's drooling over Taiwan. And so... Something could happen there. Drooling indeed. Uh, Taiwan is home to the number one, pretty much the only world's proper fabricator of semiconductor chips that is what all of our AI is made on. So it would make sense if China, in the next couple of years, before we get our AI, uh, takes over Taiwan so that at the very least, we can't get the AI chips. I mean, they have no reason not to. That's the start of World War III when that happens. So uh, get your shoes on and uh, cut your hair before they draft you. That's all I can say. Uh, this is another clip that kind of goes into a little bit more about the safety and security from Edward and Jeremy Harris on the Joe Rogan podcast, where they went just a month or so ago. It's not just safety, it's also security of these labs against attackers. So we, we know from our conversations with folks at these labs, one, that there has been at least one attempt by adversary nation state entities to get access to the weights of a cutting edge AI model. And we also know separately that at least as of a few months ago, in one of these labs, there was a running joke in the lab that we, literally it went like, we are an adversary, like name the countries, top AI lab because all our shit is getting spied on all the time. So you have one, this is happening. These exfiltration attempts are happening. And two, the security capabilities are just known to be inadequate at at least some of these places. And you put those together, everyone kind of, you know, it's not a, really a secret that China, the, their, their, their civil military fusion and their essentially the party state has an extremely mature infrastructure to identify, extract and integrate the rate limiting components to their industrial economy. Yeah, uh, China definitely is already trying to do subterfuge and infiltrate OpenAI and all of the AI companies. Um, so it kind of makes sense why they're bringing in Rob Nakasome if they are genuinely not planning on entering into any kind of agreement with China and working with them, but instead just want to beat China to it because they're like, well, we got to cut them out. We got to take military level precision as far as our security goes. We got to do a Manhattan style project, Manhattan project style operation here, which is uh, kind of scary to see the, the balkanization happening. And uh, it's kind of like, <laughs> If you're old enough to have been around during the Cold War, this is way crazier than the Cold War ever was. The Cold War, the only real issue was they kept making too many nuclear missiles and they had to sit back and realize we have 
so many nuclear missiles, we don't even need all of them. Why do we have this many? This one isn't just going to result in too many missile silos. This is a totally different type of race entirely. Um, the other important thing to realize is what are the final goals? Where are we going with this? What is the actual thing that we're trying to race China with besides just to get AI, this nebulous concept of AI and greater economic power? The answer is if you have better manufacturing, if you have AI that can do all of the jobs of humans, including design jobs, designing factories and supply chains and mining, all kind of resource collection, what you need at that point is more resources. And the only way to get more resources, aside from what we have on Earth, without, of course, destroying the only ecosystem within our the view of our telescopes, uh, we probably should be mining more stuff in the solar system, like asteroids. So we don't want China to beat us to that, because whichever country first starts claiming asteroids and mining them, According to international space treaties, that's their stuff as soon as they land on it. So we want to be the first people to land on it, and we want to beat China to that by far. So, essentially what I'm saying is, whoever wins this next part of this race wins, and whoever doesn't win it is fucked forever. Never has... Uh, any kind of global or geopolitical power at all. China will be forced to go thousands of years without another chance. So you see why this might be something they might start a war about. Um, uh -huh. This isn't yes. just like about Taiwan. <laughs> this is way bigger than Taiwan. Uh, so speaking of space, let's hear from the director of NASA himself, Bill Nelson. When used right, AI accelerates the pace of discovery. And it can support our missions. It can drive our research. It can analyze our data. It can support our spacecraft, aircraft, science, and a lot more. And it can open new possibilities in our ability to land on celestial bodies and to navigate to them, to peer into the vast corners of the cosmos and even in the search for life. And remember, that's a statutory requirement of NASA, searching for life. That's why we're digging on Mars right now. That's why we're looking for exoplanets. And it goes on and on. I said, like, geez, Grandpa Nelson looking like a vampire. <laughs> he definitely is the silent generation. He's my grandparents' generation. He's not a boomer. Was and he Biden's brother? <laughs> they looked a little bit like George H.W. Bush to some degree. Maybe like George Bush's dad. The brother that they left in the attic. Yeah. Yeah. You shut up, Nelson. His emphasis on AIs of helping our journey in journeys in space is, you know, it's important to hear it out of the mouth of NASA. So you don't just take my <laughs> take my word for it. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a documentarian. <coughs> so uh, speaking of scientists and their word being better than my word. One of the best podcasts I've ever listened to in the last year is the podcast called AGI and the Economy, some, 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 uh, you'll see it here in a second, uh, with Carl Schulman on the 80,000 Hours podcast, which I do believe is an effective altruist podcast, similar to the organization that a lot of people in OpenAI are a part of regarding like AI theorism and analysis of like where it's going to go and what the safety issues are so check this out this is incredible and the detail orientedness with which he like parses out everything if you want a good thing to watch besides the 
Leopold Ashenbrenner, Dwar Kesh Patel podcast or his paper, Situational Awareness, this is the one to go to if you want to get really in the nitty gritty. So check this out. Fewer moral qualms um, would, might be attached to the idea of just outgrowing the rival. So if you have an expansion of industrial equipment uh, and whatnot that is sufficiently large and that then involves seizing natural resources that right now are unclaimed. Because in, remember, in this world, the limit on the supply of industrial equipment and such that can exist is a natural resource base limit. Uh, and right now, most natural resources are, are not in use. So most of the, the solar energy, say, that re reaches the Earth is actually hitting the oceans in Antarctica. Uh, the, you know, the claimed territory of sovereign states is actually a minority uh, of the surface of the Earth because the oceans are largely international waters. And then if you consider beyond Earth, um, that again is not the territory of any state. Uh, there is a treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, that says it's the common heritage of all mankind. But that, if that does not translate into blocking industrial expansion there, you could imagine a state letting loose this robotic machinery that replicates at a very rapid rate. If it doubles 12 times uh, in a year, you have 4,096 uh, times as much. <laughs> By the time other powers catch up to that robotic technology, if they were, say, a year or so behind, uh, it could be that there are robots loyal to the first mover that are already on all the asteroids on the moon and whatnot. And unless one tried to forcibly dislodge them, uh, which wouldn't really work because of the disparity of industrial equipment, uh, then there could be an indefinite and permanent gap in industrial and military equipment. And that applies even after every state has access to the latest AI technology. Even after the technology gap is closed, a gap in natural resources can remain indefinitely. Because right now, those sorts of natural resources, they're too expensive to acquire. They have almost no value. The international system has not allocated them. But in a post-AI world, the basis of economic and industrial and military power undergoes this radical shift, where it's no longer so much about the human populations and skills and productivity. And in a few cases, things like oil, oil revenues and whatnot. Rather, it's about uh, access to natural resources, which are the bottleneck to the expansion of industry. So, yeah, um, I would like to say, since hopefully at this point you're starting to be a little convinced that I'm not completely full of hokey shit. Um, I came up with all of these concepts before I started watching these podcasts, before I started doing research. And only now are people starting to see, oh, yeah, the thing that I've been saying for years is what all of the top scientists are saying, all of the Harvard-educated scientists like Carl Schulman. Like, these aren't just random people. These are some of the most respected people in AI theorist fields right now, today. Uh, so, speaking of respect to scientists, we got another one, Nick Bostrom is the guy that coined the term existential risk regarding AI. And he also, ironically, came up with the definition of simulation theory. Like, maybe it's a probability that would suggest that we might be in a simulation, not in the real original reality. All that aside, very interesting theory or hypothesis. Uh, but yeah, this is a podcaster that's asking him about the dangers of multipolarity, which means multiple countries having AI and racing for AI instead of just one country. You have different dangers with one country. That's called a singleton event. Multipolar event is when more than one countries or companies have AI and are racing each other with it. So check this out. Do you see any other barriers beside just our ability to produce a super intelligent technology or a super intelligent AI? Other barriers beyond that to our reaching utopian states? Uh, 
Yes. I mean, first of all, it would be uh, crucial that the superintelligence is well aligned because um, otherwise, yeah, that might be our undoing. Um, and second, if you have scenarios uh, multipolar in character, like if you have many different entities ultimately with their own AI uh, assistance, that, that then a lot of the same dynamics that uh, we see on the planet today with arms races and uh, um, oppression and warfare and exploitation of the uh, global commons by sort of spewing pollutants into the atmosphere or overfishing the oceans, all of that could still occur and, and indeed could be intensified uh, in this kind of hyper competitive economy that might be created. Um, if on the other hand, you don't have a multipolar, but like a, a unipolar or as I call it, like a singleton scenario where it gets all consolidated, then there's the obvious question of um, who controls that uh, singleton, right? And how uh, benevolent and wise is whatever the mechanism, whether it's like a global democracy or a dictatorship or whatever it is. is. Yeah, that is the term that you can use if you're describing that multiple entities, a multipolar race. And any analyst and theorist that predicts a multipolar race almost exclusively predicts it ends very poorly. The only thing and Leopold Aschenbrenner talks about this in great detail, and we'll get back into this again with him. The only thing that makes that work is if one of the entities that's creating AI does so at just fast enough of a speed that then they can conquer the other entity before that entity catches up. That's the only way this becomes not death. Okay. Yeah. So those are our two options, either death or new world order, which considering that these elites are very eugenicist, I think it's just death or death. death <laughs> Why would they death. keep us around? Yeah. So uh, let's get more into, into this. Check this clip out. Whew, you're not making me feel better. <laughs> I love all this encouraging talk, but I just am, I'm this I'm playing this out, and I'm I'm seeing the overlord, you know, and uh, I'm seeing President AI because it won't be affected by all the issues that we're we're seeing with current president. Dude, it's it's super hard to imagine a way that this plays out. Like I, I think it's important to be intellectually honest about this, and and I think any I would really challenge like the leaders of any of these frontier labs to describe a future. Um, that is stable and multipolar where, you know, there's there's like more we, we we've... were like Google's got like an AGI and open AI has got an AGI and like mm. like and, and, and really, really bad shit doesn't happen every day. Like, I mean, that's that's the challenge. And so, you know, the, the question is, how can you tee things up ultimately such that there's as much democratic oversight as much, you know, the, the public is as empowered as it can be? That's the kind of situation that we need to be having. I think there's this like a game of smoke and mirrors that sometimes gets played. At least you could interpret it that way where people lay out these. You'll notice it's always very fuzzy visions of the future. Every time you get a the kind of like, here's where we see things going. It's mm -hmm. going to be wonderful. The technology is going to be so, so empowering. Think of all the diseases we'll cure. All of that is 100 percent true. And that's actually what excites us. It's why we got into AI in the first place. It's why we build these systems. But um, really, you know, challenging yourself to try to imagine how do you get stability and highly capable AI systems uh, in a way with, where the public is actually empowered. Those three ingredients really don't want to be in the same room with each other. And so actually confronting that head on, I mean, that's what we try to do in the, the action plan. I think it, I we mean, try to solve for one one aspect of that so the whole like yeah. i mean you will you're you're right this is a an, a whole other can of worms is like how do you govern a system like this not just from a technical standpoint but like who votes on like what it how does right. that even work democratic multipolar or democratic singleton ai is a fantasy that has been communicated by multiple people uh, where it's like, oh, say we have a singleton AI. It's not multipolar. It's not a race anymore. 
say we're going to give everybody UBI, all the people get to, you know, just fuck off and not work and just hang out with their friends and make art, do drugs, watch TV, watch VR, <laughs> play video games, all of that stuff. How do we make it still democratic in that case? And OpenAI has talked about, especially Sam Altman in particular, has talked about ways to make that democratic. Sounds a little bit pie in the sky. Too optimistic. So let's hear what he himself has to say about this stuff. All right. Let's talk about um, governance of open AI. So one of my favorite quotes, I can't read the whole thing because there's UN prohibitions. Um, but this is from an interview you gave to The New Yorker eight years ago and you were t when I worked there. And you were talking about governance of open AI. And you said, we're planning a way to allow wide swaths of the world to elect representatives to a new governance board of the company. Because if I weren't in on this, I'd be like, why do these effers get to decide what happens to me? So tell me about that quote and your thoughts on it now. Um, something like that is still uh, what I believe would be good to do. Uh, we continue to talk about how to implement governance. Um, I probably shouldn't say too much more right now, but uh, I remain excited about something in that direction. Say a little bit more. I will pass, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, well, let me ask you about the critique. Yeah, so uh, he doesn't really, it's all anything that Sam Altman ever says that's like hopeful and like, oh, it's gonna be good, we're gonna figure this out. Essentially, when anybody presses him on the details, it always comes down to, uh, I don't know, it's just vague, hopeful, airy kind of ideas and concepts with no real practical plan on how to go about that. And uh, there's another clip from that same interview with the UN, by the way. That's where this presentation was being given. And uh, let's hear what he has to say more about this topic. I've heard you talk about, and it was, uh, it was in, in the Joe Rogan podcast, and it was in passing. And you mentioned that you can imagine a future where governance is actually every individual has a say. So they're 8 billion, or let's say it's at a time when they're 12 billion people, and you can almost input your preferences uh, about what decisions you want to have made. And some AI that understands your preferences can then lead to dec better decision making. Do you think that is a real possibility? And should the UN, we're here at the UN, should they do that? Well, first of all, I hope it is at a time where there's 12 billion people and not 4 billion people. Um, I'm, I'm definitely a little bit worried about the trends there. Uh, but, but yes, I think it would be a great project for the UN to start talking about how we're going to collect the alignment set of humanity and also within that, like, how much, like, where the defaults are, where the bounds are how people like can move things within there. Uh, I think that'd be a great thing for the end to do. I still don't trust those eyebrows. He looks like a freaking serial killer just trying to collect data from all the people he talks to so I can just say false things. Yeah, false he hope. needs he <laughs> needs to get some more follicles planted on there. He looks like He's turning the, into Hellraiser. He needs to stop. No, he looks like the character that is Satan in The Passion of the Christ. Yeah. I swear, he uh, like I imagine that he, like when in his dreams he's like holding a little baby and has like worms coming in and out of his nose. Oh, that's the thing in the Passion of the Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, let's actually get into what Leopold Ashenbrenner. I don't remember that part at all. Uh, yeah, what <laughs> Leopold Ashenbrenner has to say about multipolarity. Some that sort of like human level and a system that is like vastly superhuman, right? Might be like five, five ooms, you know, I mean, even, even on the current pace, right? We went from, you know, I think, you know, on the math benchmark recently, right? Like, you know, three years ago on the math benchmark, we, um, you know, th that was, you know, this is sort of com uh, really difficult high school competition math pro problems. You know, we were at, you know, a few percent, couldn't solve anything. Now it's solved. Um, and that was sort of at normal, the normal pace of AI progress. You didn't have sort of a billion super intelligent resources, researchers. So like a year is a huge difference. And then particularly after super intelligence, right? Once this is applied to sort of lots of elements of R&D, once you get the sort of like industrial explosion with robots and so on, um, you know, I think, 
a year, you know, a couple years might be kind of like decades worth of technological progress. And might, you know, again, it's like Gulf War One, right? 20, 30 years of technological lead, totally decisive. You know, I, th I, I think it really matters. The other reason it really matters is, um, you know, suppose, suppose they steal the weight, suppose they steal the algorithms and, you know, they're close on our tails. Suppose we still pull out ahead, right? We just kind of, we, we're a little bit faster, you know, we're three months ahead. I think the sort of like world in which we're really neck and neck, you know, you only have a three month lead are incredibly dangerous, right? And we're in this like feverish struggle where like if they get ahead, they get to dominate, you know, sort of maybe they'd get a decisive advantage. They're building clusters like crazy. They're they're willing to throw all caution to the wind. We have to keep up. There's some crazy new WMDs popping up. And then we're gonna be in the situation where it's like, you know, crazy new military technology, crazy new WMDs, you know, like deterrence, mutually disturbed instruction, like keeps changing, you know, every few weeks. And it's like, you know, completely unstable, volatile situation. Is incredibly dangerous. So it's I think I think you know both both from just the technologies are dangerous from the alignment point of view. You know I think it might be really important during the intelligence explosion to have the sort of six month uh, you know wiggle room to be like look we're going to like dedicate more compute to alignment during this period because we have to get it right. We're feeling uneasy about how it's going, and um, so I think in some sense that like one of the most important inputs to whether we will kind of destroy ourselves or whether we will get through this just incredibly crazy period is whether we have that buffer. Um, why? Uh, so before we go yeah. further object level in this, yeah. I think it's very much worth noting yeah. that almost nobody, at least yeah. nobody I talk to, yeah. thinks about the geopolitical implications of AI. Yeah. And I think I have some object level disagreements that we'll get into, but yeah. um, or at least uh, things I want to yeah. iron out. I may not disagree yeah. Yeah. in the end. Yeah. But the basic premise that yeah. obviously if you keep scaling and obviously if yeah. people realize yeah. that this is where intelligence is yeah. headed, it's not just going to be like the um, the same old world where like what model are we deploying tomorrow yeah, and yeah, what is the latest yeah. like well, if people on Twitter are like oh the, the GPT four is going <laughs> to sh shake your expectations <laughs> or whatever. Um, you know, COVID is really interesting because before a year or something, yeah. when March twenty twenty hit, yeah, we it, it became clear to the world like president, CEOs, yeah, media, yeah, average yeah, person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's other things happening in the world right now, but the main thing we as a yeah. world are dealing with right now is COVID. Soon on AGI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember when people were freaking the fuck out about COVID? Yeah. Everybody? Yes. AGI is the next thing they're going to be freaking out about. And mm -hmm. if they're not... They're stupid. It's the next yeah, intelligence they're not test. they're paying attention. They're numb and dumb and just are like, whatever. Yeah. Let's That's a great see. way of putting it. So speaking of this neck and neck multipolar race that ends badly, let's go back to what Trump has to say about China. So it brings with it difficulty, but we have to be at the forefront. It's going to happen. And if it's going to happen, we have to take the lead over China. China is the primary threat in terms of that and you know what they need more than anything else is electricity they have to have electricity massive amounts of electricity i don't know if you know that in order to do these essentially it's a plant and the electricity needs are greater than anything we've ever needed before to do ai at the highest level and China will produce it because they'll do whatever you have to do, whereas we have environmental impact people and, you know, we have a lot of people trying to hold us back. But uh, massive amounts of electricity are needed in order to do AI. And we're going to have to generate a whole different level of uh, energy. And we can do it, and I think we should do it, but we have to be very careful with it. Right? We have to watch it. But it's... Uh, you know, the words you use were exactly right. It's the words a lot of smart people are using. Uh, you know, there are those people that say it takes over, it takes over the human race. It's really powerful stuff, mm. AI. Mm. So let's see how it all works out. But I think as long as it's there, it, see it's... See how it plays out. And that's just, and that's just AI. What, when, what about when it becomes SI or super intelligence? Yeah, yeah, no, then they'll have super AI, right? <laughs> super duper AI. But, but what, they, what it does is so... Crazy. It's amazing. What it does is so crazy. Super duper AI. What your face do is so crazy. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <sighs> oh, Trump.
But yeah, clearly he knows about this stuff. Clearly he has people in his ear talking about where this is going. This is the first time I've ever seen a presidential candidate go into any great detail. Like Biden did a little speech about it. Clearly he wasn't even remembering anything. It was just on a teleprompter. I doubt he knows or cares anything about AI. He's just like, oh, we're going to let Eric Schmidt do his thing. <laughs> Pretty much, literally. And uh, I don't know. It's just interesting to track what our government thinks about China and what the level of animosity is at. This is more of just a silly thing, but this popped up. Uh, yeah. China has a 5,000-year history of cheating and stealing. Some things will never change. Senator Marsha Blackburn. And then someone from China's state-affiliated media just replied and said, Bitch. <laughs> uh, sometimes you just gotta laugh. <laughs> Back to Leopold Ashenbrenner. And... Um, I think that makes it basically, I think any sort of arms control agreement that comes at a situation where it's close, very unstable. Uh, th that's really interesting. This is very analogous to kind of a debate I had with Rose on the podcast where he argued for nuclear disarmament. Uh -huh. But if some country tries to break out and yeah. starts developing nuclear weapons, yeah. the six months or whatever that you would get is enough to get international consensus and invade the country and prevent them from getting nukes. Uh -huh. And I thought that was sort of, that's not a stable equilibrium. It just seemed but really so, tough, yeah. Um, the, I mean, but look, so, so yeah. On, on this, right? Yeah. So like maybe it's a bit easier because you have AGI and so yeah. like you can monitor the other person's cluster or something yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. data centers, you can see them from space actually. Yeah. You can see the energy draw they're getting. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of things, as you were saying, like, you, you, there's a lot of ways to get information yeah. Yeah. from yeah. an environment if you're really dedicated. Yeah. And also because unlike a nukes, the data centers are, Nukes, you have obviously the yeah. uh, submarines, planes, yeah. Yeah. you have uh, bunkers, mountains, yeah. whatever. You have them yeah. so many different places. A data center, the t your 100 gigawatt data center, we can blow that shit up if you're like, we're concerned, right? Like just a, some cruise missile or something. Yeah. But it's like very vulnerable to sabotage. I mean, that, that gets to the sort of, I mean, that gets to the sort of insane vulnerability, the volatility of this period post super intelligence, right? Because basically, I think, so you have the intelligence explosion, you have these like vastly superhuman things on your cluster, but you're like, you haven't done the industrial explosion yet. You don't have your robots yet. You haven't kind of, you haven't covered the desert in like robot factories yet. And that is the sort of crazy moment where, you know, say say the United States is ahead, the CCP is somewhat behind. There's actually an enormous incentive for first strike, right? Because if they can take out your data center, they, you know, they know you're about to have just this commanding yep. decisive lead. They know if we can just take out this data center, right. you know, then we can stop it. And you know, they might get desperate. And um you know, I, so I think it basically we're going to get into a position it's it's actually I think it's going to be pretty hard to defend early on. I think we're basically going to be in a position where we're protecting data centers with like the threat of nuclear retaliation. Mm. It's like maybe sounds kind of crazy though, you know. And is, is this the inverse of the Eliezer? We got to attack the data centers <laughs> yeah, and nuclear I mean, weapons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nuclear, nuclear deterrence for data centers. I mean, this is, uh, you know, Berlin, you know, in the like late 50s, early 60s, yeah. uh, both Eisenhower and Kennedy multiple times kind of made the threat of full on nuclear war against the Soviets if they tried to encroach on West yeah. Berlin. Um, so yeah, if you're ever wondering like, what happens if China tries to nuke our data center or even just bomb our data centers when we're making AI, when it's very clear that this shit is going on? Yeah, we'll have to nuke them. That's the level of strategic awareness that we have to have for this kind of situation in the coming years. It's going to get to that point so fucking fast. And no, we're not ready for that. People are not ready for how insane this is going to be. The other thing he talked about was first mover advantage. So crucial to my whole worldview and my perception of what's most likely going to happen just by me following the incentives down their natural conclusions. Just like putting myself in the shoes of amoral elites that want power, that are fighting this multipolar fight, and wondering what kind of first mover advantages would be successful against China. So one that Carl Schulman, in fact, talks about, uh, and I'll probably have a clip in there a little later. He literally 
talks about how if we have a robotic explosion, meaning we have ro- factories that make factories just booming and doubling across the Nevada and the New Mexico desert, just like filling open space with factories. That is when we are going to have a situation where we can build so many robots, tiny and large, that we can fill the oceans with robots. We can remove nuclear deterrence to where we can find their subs. We can find their silos. We can remove them before they happen. That is where we're going with first mover advantage. And even before we get to that point, if we want to slow them down, what is the best way to take care of the the eugenicist issue and the strategic multipolarity issue? I think it's a bioweapon. We already had one. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah. Check this shit out. This is Peter Diamandis, God bless his soul, talking with a Chinese guy from, I think, HTC, one of those tech companies in China, about the AI multipolarity issue. You bridge both worlds. And what I've seen over the last three years is an increasing, um, uh, you know, tension growing, and especially in the realm of AI and that can't be good for humanity. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Because you know, one of the things I'm going to bring to the abundant stage this coming year is, you know, the, I want to bring a balance to that conversation. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, I think that the rhetoric on both sides have just gotten very overheated. Um, you know, over the last six months, I've actually seen a little bit of reconciliation. So, so it is a little bit better than it was a year ago. Um, but I, I think it'll probably get worse before it gets better because of the elections. There's, you know, whenever there's an election, you have to create a, an external enemy. Um, and the, 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 the reality is, is that these two countries need each other. And these two countries right now are the, the, the leading drivers of growth and innovation in the world. And if they work together, we can solve so many problems, right? If you look at the AI side, there was a report that was recently uh, published that showed um, 50% of the world's AI researchers were actually were born in China, of the world's AI research. 37% of, of the AI researchers in a top AI research, top 20% AI researchers in the US are actually from China. And only 37% are from the US. So actually, more re- there are more Chinese-born re- researchers in AI in the US than there are US-born. Right? So, it's clear that these two countries are already working together, but we're because of, you know, I guess, um, policies and, and governmental positioning, um, we're creating this artificial conflict. And we're, you know, you know, I guess some is economically driven, some is politically driven, but, you know, it's actually made worse recently because of all of the, the hardware restrictions, right? So not, not only is, you know, is the, the the U.S. talking about hey, I you know we 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 can't work together, but they're also saying you can't buy this equipment, you can't buy equipment not from U.S. companies, but not also from uh, other companies in the world that are supplying the semiconductor space or that are creating chips that are creating whatever, and, and that that you know essentially what that does is saying okay, you need to create your your parallel technology stack, and we will become more and more bifur- bifurcated. And the, 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 the interdependence that we created that actually unites people becomes weaker and weaker. And I think that's the completely the, the opposite thing that we need to do. Because when these two countries are both so smart, so powerful, so capable, and in economic perspectives, they're, they're becoming more and more equal. If you create enemies out of each other, it won't end well, right? We've seen in history what happens when, that, when, when you know, two very strong com- countries are put into that type of adversarial uh, relationship. So, so I really, I really hope the the you know this is just just a short term issue because of the elections that we'll go back to where we have been for the last 20, 30 years, where there was a lot of cooperation and the growth. You know, there was more growth out of China uh, over the last thirty years than you know, essentially almost the rest of the, the world combined. 
in terms of economic GDP growth. So, now we've got a beautiful clip. This clip is very inspiring to me. Like, it makes me very happy to hear this coming out of this person. Mustafa Suleiman is one of the former Google DeepMind founding members who then went on to form his own AI company, Inflection AI, to create basically like a therapy chatbot. Pretty good therapy chatbot. You've used it before. Yes, Pi. It's pretty good. Yeah. Helps me formulate messages a lot easier. It's card. Makes it Hell a lot yeah. easier. We have a, a user right there. How many stars of a, of a review would you give his tool out of five? Mm, four to five, since sometimes you have to like correct it and fix it. And... <laughs> I think that's just <sighs> chat box. Yes, but sometimes it can be a little passive aggressive. True, true. I'm like, that's not me. It's easier to misinterpret text. Yeah. So anyway, Mustafa Suleiman was then, he sold his company, Pi, and he's now the CEO of Microsoft AI, Microsoft's AI subsidiary, through which them as a 49% share investor of OpenAI, he's a very powerful man now in the AI sphere. And I feel like he's a little bit too forward about this stuff. He's the only person of the tech company CEOs in this sphere that is this forward but at the same time while i kind of appreciate what he's saying still comes off a little creepy at the very least just disturbing so check this out again i don't buy the metaphor that there is a finish line this is another false frame it's actually very much also true in the context of our race with china we're going head to head it's zero sum there will be a finish line and when we cross it we will have an agi and if we get it three years before them we'll be able to disempower them like, this is just stop it we have to stop framing everything as an adversarial race like it is true that we have ferocious competition with them they are an independent company we don't own or control them we don't even have any board members <laughs> you know so they do entirely their own thing but we have a deep partnership i'm very good friends with sam have huge respect and you know trust and faith in what they have done and that's how it's going to roll for many many years to come you mentioned china Speak to where you think, I, mean, I know you don't like the frame, but I think people want to at least understand what's going on, which is to say, where are we relative to where are they? Yeah. If we approach this with a default adversarial mindset, which with all due respect to my good friends in DC and the military industrial complex is the default frame that it can only be a new Cold War, then that is exactly what it will be, because it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. They will fear that we fear that we are going to be adversarial, so they have to be adversarial. And this is only going to escalate and will end in catastrophe. And so we have to find ways to cooperate, be respectful of them, whilst also acknowledging that we have different set of values. And frankly, when I look out over the next century, I think that peace is going to be a product of us as in the West, and particularly America leading the tip of the spear there, knowing how to gracefully degrade the, the, the empire that we have managed over the previous century. Because this is a rising power of phenomenal force with a different set of values for us. And so we have to find ways to coexist without judgment, without going to war with them unnecessarily, because I think that would be terrible for both of us. Did you see that expression he gave at the end? What's he wearing? Check this out. I'm going to play that part again. Check this. Going to war with them unnecessarily, because I think that would be terrible for both of us. <laughs> because I think that would be terrible for both of us. Are you paying attention? He gave like an expression, like a, a British supervillain, like a comically Dr. evil. Yeah, comically like without the finger in his mouth. Warning. Yeah, very He's dressed like Doctor Evil, just wearing black. He Seriously, really I got was... chills when I first watched that. Fucking crazy. Speaking of the coming war with China, 
Uh, we got our good friend TD on the case. And so the government, now if the government said to us, now they're, they're starting to do these really interesting things. They're going, we need the draft. We want to, we want to do that again. Germany's thinking about that. We're thinking military times ran an article where they're like selective service. Uh, we should, we should reinstate the draft. Um, there's so not people. Yeah, how are starting, about you go fuck yourself? How's that sound? That's right. People, go ahead and do that. And then we can talk. People are starting to perk their ears up now. That changes everything. People start to go, wait a minute. What's going on? Because they're clearly preparing for something huge. This is in the cards. You can feel it. It's you talk to military people about it. They're kind of um, they kind of go. Meh. It's there's a I don't even know if they know, but there's something ominous that they're preparing for. It's just you can feel it that they're preparing for something big. They're floating all these ideas about drafts. We haven't heard these for 20, 30 years. Not even when supposedly, remember terrorists were going to blow up every city in America? We didn't hear about the draft. We didn't hear about the draft. When terrorists were going to blow up everything, you're going to be sitting at a lunch table, it's going to blow up. We didn't hear about the draft. Now we're hearing about the draft. Something's coming. I don't know what's coming, but something ominous. They're planning for something. And if you can kind of feel it. I mean, I don't know if that's something that you've picked up on or you you think I certainly maybe, have maybe you think I'm, I'm, maybe i'm being dramatic you're I don't not know. being dramatic and no. i mean tim dylan is very gay and very dramatic but um that's a totally different topic we are preparing for world war three and a game trailer just came out the past couple of weeks marvel or is it no. dc what Neither of those oh, things. Oh, my bad. Um, it's about AI, and it's about the future. It's a little bit fun. It's slightly less realistic and just more fun with, like, mechs and stuff. About the future wars that we have to expect. This is a little clip from the trailer called The Forever Winter. Check this out. Once you're kitted up, it's time to enter the macro city of Lost Angels. Megastructures meant to house millions lie vacant, while automated underground factories churn out war machines by the minute. As the war rages and destroys the world by day, AI-driven machines nicknamed the Night Shift rebuild by night. Recovery units stalk the streets, dragging the wounded and the dead to be harvested for their organs. Learn your surroundings, avoid patrols, and maybe you can make it out alive. chilling very chilling and uh this next clip is just uh, a channel that kind of like did some explanation and did a little bit of a little documentary on what this game actually is explains it a little bit better uh check this shit out europa eurasia euruska Roving battalions of mechanized military factions engage each other in an eternal conflict whose meaning has been lost to time. The politicians who started the war are dead. AI algorithms direct fire teams like board game pieces. Towering mobile gun platforms become deities for the communities of soldiers at their feet embedded in trench lines for generations. Megacities are raised and then rebuilt overnight by 3D printers, the original shape and meaning of structures and monuments becoming warped, skewed by the hellfire around them. The line between weapon and man has been blurred. War itself as a symbiotic organism of flesh, steel, and gunpowder. You are in the middle of it all, and you're not on either side. Yeah, it's an excellent reminder, a visual reminder for exactly how bad this could go. Like, we have no idea. We have no visual representation for something that's a technology of this power. Now, obviously that's a little bit fantastical, specifically because they don't have those killer drones that we showed the short film of earlier that would make that much more fast and efficient. Um, satellites using thermal imagery, directing tiny drones that just sit and wait and charge with tiny little solar panels until they're ready to be used. Yeah, you could, it's like, 
the most horrifying version of warfare you could ever imagine. And that's essentially inevitable. And the fact that we're speeding towards this and none of our leaders are mentioning in grisly detail exactly where this is going. They're just like using big lofty phrases and like, well, we need to be careful about the strategic blah, 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 blah. No, you got to paint a picture. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So we got one more uh, lovely little intro uh, to this China and space race thing with the lovely Leopold Ashenbrenner. I think basically we want to get in a position where it is clear that the United States, that a sort of coalition of democratic allies will win. It's clear the United States would declare to China. You know, that will require having locked down the secrets. That will require having built the 100 gigawatt cluster in the United States and having done the natural gas and doing what's necessary. And then when it is clear that the democratic coalition is well ahead, then you go to China and then you offer them a deal. And you know, China will know they're going to win. This is going to be, they're very scared of what's going to happen. We're going to know we're going to win, but we're also very scared of what's going to happen because we really want to avoid this kind of like breakneck, breakneck race right at the end um, and where things could really go awry. And, you know, and then, and then, so then we offer them a deal. I think there's an incentive to come to the table. I think there's a sort of more stable arrangement you can do. It's a sort of an atoms for peace arrangement. And we're like, look, we're going to respect you. We're not, we're not going to like, we're not going to use super intelligence against you. You can do what you want. You're going to get your, like, you're going to get your slice of the galaxy. Um, we're going to like, we're going to benefit share with you. We're going to have some like compute agreement where it's like, there's some ratio of compute that you're allowed to have. And that's like enforced with her like imposing AIs or whatever. And, um, and we're just not going to do, we're just not going to do this kind of like volatile sort of WMD arms race to the death. We're good. And sort of, it's like a new world order that's US led, that's sort of democratic led, but that respects China, lets them do what they want. Okay, there's so much to, <laughs> there's so much there. Um, I honestly think like there's been a lot of people, and <clears throat> John Sherman, <clears throat> who have said that Leopold Aschenbrenner doesn't have enough of a safety mindset. And I would be right there with you. He doesn't really cover the part where we have to slow down specifically so we can actually align AI correctly. He doesn't really get into that. He's more talking about we need to build fast enough so then we can give China a race so that we'll give them a better deal than they would have gotten if we went to war with them or if they just got totally locked out of galaxy solar system resources but if we actually think about it when has the u.s when has our bankers one of our elites ever just given somebody a nice bargain for no reason because it meant oh well we just don't want to fight a war well I think the main reason they do that is when they don't think they can win the war. If they have good enough AI, I don't think they'll give a bargain to China. I don't think they'll do that. And I don't think Leopold Aschenbrenner is correct in assuming that, but he does get the whole thing of like, we need to coordinate with them. We don't need to fight them. We need to coordinate with them. And I know it's difficult. It's honestly more difficult to coordinate with them than it is to just roundly conquer them with AI. But I don't believe in the singleton events being good for the citizenry. Why would we, if we don't have jobs, be kept around? We wouldn't. We'll be we wouldn't. removed. And uh, let's look at another little clip about that. Well, you've got to wonder what happens to the general population, people that work menial jobs, people that their life is going to be taken over by automation and how susceptible those people are going to be. They're not going to have any agency. They're going to be relying on a check. And this idea of like going out and doing something, it used to be learn to code, right? Yeah. But that's out the window because yeah. nobody needs to code now because AI is going to code quicker, faster, much better, no errors. You're, you're going to have a giant swath of the population that has no purpose. I think that's actually like a completely real. I was watching um, this like talk by a bunch of open AI researchers a couple days ago. 
and um, it was recorded from from a while back. But they were basically saying uh, they were they were exploring exactly that question, right? Because they ask themselves that all the time, and their attitude was sort of like, well, yeah, I mean, I uh, I guess it's gonna you know suck or whatever. Um, like, we'll, we'll probably be okay for longer than most people because we're actually building the thing that automates the thing. Um, maybe there are going to be some... They, they like to get fancy sometimes and say, like, oh, now uh, you could do some thinking, of course, to uh, identify the jobs that will be most secure. And uh, and it's like, I do some thinking to identify the job. Like, you, like, what if you're a, like you're a janitor or you're, or you're like a freaking plumber? Or you're going to just change your... Like, how, how is that supposed to work? Do some thinking, especially if you have a mortgage and a family and you're I mean, already yeah. in the hole. Yeah. So they, they like the only solution. And this happens so often. Like there really is no plan. That's the, the the single biggest thing that you get hit over the head with over and over. Whether it's talking to the people who are in charge of the, the like labor transition, their whole thing is like, yeah, universal basic income, and then eh, question mark, and then smiley face. That's basically the three steps that they envision. Mm. Um, it's the same when you look internationally. Like how are we gonna like okay tomorrow you build an AGI that's like incredibly powerful potentially dangerous thing what is the plan like how are you gonna like i don't know you're gonna secure it share it figure like, it out as we go along man yeah that's, that's all that's, that's the freaking message like that, that's that is it, the entire plan is- we'll figure out as we go along man yeah no they haven't planned they're not stupid they haven't planned this because they know we're just going to kill everybody. Yeah. They would have planned it out. They would have presented a plan if there was a plan. There's no plan. It's just bioweapon or bust. <laughs> Death. Destruction. Yeah. Uh, another little nail in the coffin. The lovely Lex Friedman. One of the, One of the things I enjoy in life is how terrified... Uh, people like you, like, yes. I'm a huge fan, by the way, get a, a robot. Well, I am. I'm concerned about AI, like completely getting rid of the need for human beings because human beings. I mean, you you go out in the street and you go, so few of these people are necessary. Even now, even now, you look at people and you go, they're hanging on by a thread, right? Yeah. And you can just imagine how many jobs are gonna get replaced, how many industries are going to be completely remade with AI, and the pace of change worries me a little bit because we do a very bad job in this country of mitigation when we have problems. We don't do a great job. We did a not great job with COVID, right? We don't do a good job. It's just something we don't do well. We kinda, we're good in booms and busts. We're good when it's good, and we're actually, we kinda know how to kinda like, Hey, we're bottomed out. We're like a we're like a gambling addict in this country. We like we know what it feels like to be outside of an OTB at nine a.m. drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. Going, yeah. I'm going to build it back, and we know what it's like to win. But tr- anything in between, it seems not that great. So to me, it feels like, I, are we going to be able to like help people that are displaced and that have their jobs taken by? I mean, do you do you not fear? sort of an, uh, a world where you have a lot of, you know, artificial intelligence replacing workers and then what happens? Yes, I do fear that. And uh, if anything, this episode should be named Somebody Give Tim Dillon a fucking Nobel Prize. For fuck's sake. This man is a yes. fucking treasure. An international treasure. Nobody else is saying this shit. And he says it so well. He really says it so well. He studied up on his history. And he's been watching. <laughs> as everyone else should. Yeah. So, what y'all doing? Speaking of people that are haters uh, about all of my theories, I recently on Substack had an interaction with the legendary AI YouTube channel creator David Shapiro, which... God bless his soul. I really love him. I've been following him since day one of his podcast. I think he's the perfect example of someone who is kind of caught up in this whole, like, conspiracy theorists are bad. We should downvote into oblivion any kind of conspiracy theory whatsoever instead of rationally engaging with it and being like, hey, Maybe this is something that we should have a conversation about. 
And as he said, he said, this is way too conspiracy theory nonsense for me to remotely take seriously. Bro, anytime you want to have that conversation, I will happily, kindly, and lovingly debate you on this topic. We'll just lay down our cards. We'll just be like, this is why I think this. This is why I think that. And I'll we'll go have a back and forth. I would love to talk with you. If anybody knows him, is close to him that's watching this, please recommend that he talk to me. I love him, and I don't want our conversation to end the way it did. Um, I definitely believe in rationalism. I definitely believe in, you know, just hashing things out. I, I don't think we should just, you know, say this is the way it is, this isn't the way it is. We should always, always be open to discussion. Um, and I trust that when he's probably not having a bad day, I'm sure he's probably more intellectually open to that sort of thing. So, uh, one last little, truly incredible little bit here from the incredible Carl Schulman. And uh, we're going to wrap up this fucking episode, people. Uh, in dictatorships uh, and oligarchic systems, um, I think it's much more plausible. So in some countries with large oil revenues, you're Norway's um, or states like Alaska, you have fairly broad distribution of the oil revenues, uh, provident management. Uh, but you have other countries where a narrow elite um, largely steals that revenue, often squirrels it away uh, in secret bank accounts uh, or otherwise uh, channels it to corrupt purposes. Uh, and this is, reflects a more general issue of when dictatorships no longer depend on their citizenry to staff their militaries, to staff their security services, to provide taxes and industry, those checks against not just expropriating uh, the population, reducing their standard of living, but even uh, things like murder, torture, uh, and just all kinds of abuses of the civilian population are no longer checked by some of these practical incentives and would depend more on the intentions of those with political power and to some extent international international pressure mm. uh, so th that, that's something that could go pretty badly i love how the way he ended that with depending on international pressure you know what international pressure there would be to prevent abuses against citizenry what if there was a singleton event where a small group of powerful government, military, and banker elites controlled the most powerful economic force and technology in history? None. There would be no international pressure capable of doing diddly squat, which means we are completely in the power of people that do not have our best interests in mind. Probably so, they ever did. I mean, yeah, but at least they could use us for our, our labor. <laughs> use us, <laughs> abuse while. us, destroy us, eat that, us. That is how that goes. Well, that's a whole different conversation. So, in the spirit of all this gloom and doom, I always like ending on a slightly positive note. What, as people, can we do about this powerlessness? In our daily lives, we are working our jobs. Many of us have families uh, we care about and don't want to have to experience the expropriation and powerlessness of, you know, what's likely going to come upon us. There's, It's not a perfect solution by any stretch of the imagination. But I think the best the next best option, if you want to have something that can slightly reduce your anxiety and make you feel like you have a little bit of a control in this situation, build a bunker. I'm yes. not going to say this again. Actually, I will say it again many times. Build a fucking bunker. I am currently planning on building a bunker and we will be documenting the entire process soon y'all know i'm not just fronting but yeah uh speaking of bunkers 
<laughs> Check this out. <laughs> Boys, if a terrorist attack goes down, you know you're gonna want to be here. I'm going to your house. I'm gonna be, yeah, I'm gonna be your house. <laughs> We're not gonna let you in, dude. If I get in before you, I'm not gonna let you in. What? There's I'm so much room no, food. No, I'm gonna we go, need oh, to get a ranch. Have. We need to get a ranch before everything goes sideways. You'll need me to offer up as a sacrifice. Like, guys, guys, I got one for you. Yeah, <laughs> leave us alone. We'll get you. You one. need a you ranch with a well <laughs> and a bunch of animals. And yeah. You need a bunch of chickens. You need food and you need water. Chickens will always give you food. Chickens will keep. Yeah. Chickens are easy. You get one egg almost every day from a chicken. Hey, that's pretty good. Yeah, and if you have a dozen chickens, you have a dozen eggs a day, uh, or at least eight, Protein. Yep. at least eight or ten. And then so they... then you have like that's food, and then all the other food you get is a bonus, and you need water, and if things go sideways, that's real. You got a bunker? I have plans. I know. <laughs> I know. I have some plans. I got a feeling you're not gonna let me in. I will let you in. 100%. You promise? Yeah, all you guys can come in. Whoa. Yeah, everybody can come in. Nice. I just wonder I of it. if you're preparing too late. Like if shit goes down tomorrow, it's too late. Well, yeah, but you're, but the, but what about those guys who built those bunkers in the '60s and then just like ah oh, shit? You don't want a bunker. This is why. Because if it goes that bad, you don't want to be alive. You don't want to survive that. You don't. If a nuclear war happens, you don't want to be alive. If you get they hit, thought they'd wait it out five years. You're gonna yeah. come out to hell. Yeah. You're gonna yeah. come out to hell, and the people that are gonna be alive are gonna be so dangerous. Yeah, you oh, get yeah. out there, and be like, hey guys, I survived. Like, new slaves. They're yeah. gonna eat. <laughs> oh, we're gonna rape you and eat. <laughs> They're gonna eat you. Yeah. They will 100% eat you. You ever see the road? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The bleakest version of that. Brutal. But everybody knows that that's probably what would happen, at least in some parts of the world. That's why it's good. There's a nuclear submarine off the coast of my Miami. Yeah. There's not just one. There's another boat, another Soviet boat that's this out is there great. too. Yeah. Why don't we de-escalate? It'd be it should nice. Be, it'd be a real good idea. It'd be a great idea to de-escalate, don't you think? That's not going to happen. No. They're going to escalate. They're going to keep doing so. And as far as what Joe was saying about having a ranch and you don't want a bunker, it's like, yeah, well, I don't think it's going to be nuclear. I don't think nuclear is going to be part of this. Um... I think we've created technology that supersedes that. And I don't recommend a bunker because I think you need to protect yourself from nuclear radiation. I, you have a bunker to protect yourself from potentially either roving. For example, if it's an infrastructure attack or like an EMP or some kind of situation like a CME, some kind of situation where the infrastructure goes down. We can't have supply chains. No, there's no food being produced or shipped. That's a situation where you want a bunker because you don't want to have to defend your family and your food supply with weapons. No. You just, there's no guarantee you're going to make that. There's going to be people that are going to sweep in there, shoot you, and take your shit. Yep. It's just a gift to people with more people and more weapons than you have. That's all it is. You need a bunker that you can make secretly, preferably with people you know and trust, not just random contractors. And you need to make it preferably in some kind of secretive way that's not obvious to satellites what you're doing, that's not inspected and approved by county inspectors you need to have it some secret shit that nobody knows about and then you need to not come out for a bunch of fucking years and what joe said is potentially right maybe they will eat you and enslave you or kill you when you come out but at the very least start for now it's the best thing you can do. You can come to that point later on. If Mark Zuckerberg already has done it, why aren't you doing it? I mean, yeah, that's that's true. I don't trust that fucker at all. He definitely knows. Why don't you start up. thinking about yourself? <laughs> stop watching TV and shit. Yeah, I mean, stop listening to the media. Every single thing they say is a lie. Start talking to your family and friends about this shit. Share this with as many people as you think might actually listen to this because nobody's talking about this. Nobody truly is 
putting together a cohesive picture of what's happening here. And they need to be. And we're trying to. I'm sure it's cringy as hell. I'm sure it's hard for you all to listen to multiple hours of content. Sorry, this ran a little long. But like, subscribe, comment, share the hell out of this shit, and let's get this shit pumped out. Let's go. Because we love you all, and we wish you a lovely July. Peace. July's ending. Goodbye.